and also this electric force is instantaneous. So the universe is a connected whole. It is conscious. Mm. And we are a representation of the consciousness of the universe. We are here to learn, and what we learn is fed back into the universe. Uh, we are not here uh, just on a whim. We actually choose to manifest. Welcome to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Cecily. And today I have a really, really special guest here. I'm really honored to be with Wal Thornhill. Hello, Wal, and welcome. Hi, Cecily. It's very nice to uh, be here in Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, almost. Mm. I'm sure you guys already know Wal, but for those of you that don't, he's an Australian uh, physicist and he's the chief, chief science advisor for the Electric Universe which is a non-profit group that has the prime um, goal to spread the theory of the electric universe to the people. And uh, Wall is also a co-author of two books, right, Paul? Yes, yes, with my colleague David Talbot. Yeah, and one of them, the electric universe, I have right here, and then another one, Thunderbolts of the Gods. I'll, of course, leave links in the description below for all of you guys to go check. You also have a website, holoscience.com. There's the Electric Universe um, website, and then also Wall has a show on Gaia called The Electric Universe, where he as well explains the theories more. Mm -hmm. There is one other thing too, Cecily, and that is uh, the Thunderbolts.info website is the one which is most active and has forums and people can participate. Okay, wonderful. Everything will go in the description below for you guys. And if there's anything we didn't mention, just have a look in the description and um, you'll find everything so that you can connect with Wall and get to know more about the Electric Universe. Well, first of all, I'd love to know a little bit about, and for people out there, like how did you discover these theories? How, what was your first encounter? <laughs> well, I, from a very young age, I was very interested in astronomy. Um, I had an uncle who was in the uh, Australian uh, commandos in New Guinea during the war and he would bring home a field telescope and we'd look at the moon uh, through his telescope. So later I built my own telescope but uh, I was always interested in how and why things work mm. and uh, and even at school I was often ahead of the class because I, once we started a subject I wanted to know all about it so I'd go and read it up <laughs> and uh, I used to, uh, I think, uh, be a bit of a pain in the neck for the kids because uh, if the teacher didn't know something, they'd ask me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, everything. while I was at high school, and this is important really because um, at that stage, of course, you're open to all sorts of ideas. Uh, you come with a beginner's mind. And uh, I, my father, who was a war pensioner, uh, came home from the uh, military hospital with a book and he said, I think you might like to read this. It was Emmanuel Velikovsky's Worlds in Collision, mm -hmm. which was a bestseller on the New York uh, list uh, in 1950 for six months. But uh, the astronomers had apoplexy. You know, they. <laughs> it was said that Harlow Shapley, the famous American uh, astronomer, uh, almost became incoherent in his uh, re rejection of the book. Mm. And I think the reason for that is that uh, cosmology, and the book is about, of course, it says worlds in collision, uh, is about cosmology, and in particular uh, the recent history of the solar system, and it doesn't fit what we believe about Newton's law and the clockwork solar system. And uh, I read the book bef probably about midway through high school and I tried to get other kids interested and uh, I had this difficulty though, how can all the teachers and everyone that I know and respect uh, be so wrong? Because if Velikovsky was right, it meant the things I was being taught were, were just fairy stories. Uh, 
before I went to university, I decided to read it again because I thought, oh, when I get to university, I can ask questions and, uh, you know, <laughs> try and get some answers. Well, I was very disappointed when I got to university and found out that uh, I was either greeted with, um, you know, it was just ignored the question or mm -hmm. uh, the professor or whoever I was asking uh, got angry. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. In other words, it was not a rational response. So what I did was to, um, as a science undergraduate, I spent a lot of time in the anthropology section of the library just taking books off the shelf and reading creation myths from around the world and I realized that Velikovsky had made a case that had to be answered, you couldn't ignore it. Um, and so I began accumulating material without uh, bothering uh, the academics uh, and when I began a postgrad year, about halfway through I realized that I was absolutely wasting my time in academia because uh, they didn't treat anyone who asked awkward questions um, <laughs> with any respect, in fact, are more or less uh, tossed out. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, Velikovsky then published another book, Earth in Upheaval, which looked at not just the mythological stories and so on. And remember, people tend to regard myth as just stories, you know, with no actual factual uh, reference frame. But in fact, the myths were, there was a myth-making epoch, as my friend David Talbot, who's a leading mytho-historian. Mm -hmm. um, it was an epoch when they were making these stories, and wherever you go around the world, you'll find the same characters. Venus, the planet, was always female, and uh, was either had long flowing hair, I think that's where the female uh, attribute uh, came from, or she had uh, snakes, uh, the Medusa, the alter ego was, uh, you know, terrible in appearance. Yeah. Um, and Mars was always the warrior with his sword. And uh, the North American Indians knew that Mars had a scar. They called him Scarface. Now, only uh, when the uh, spacecraft, the first spacecraft went past, it, in fact, I think there was a huge dust storm at the time. They didn't actually see Ballas Marineris, but shortly afterwards another spacecraft went past and they saw this huge gash which goes a third of the way around the planet, which suggests that Velikovsky was right, that the planets uh, were at some point in time so close that people on Earth could see it quite easily. Uh, so this is just more evidence. But the other thing about Velikovsky was that he made some predictions which were quite outrageous. Uh, one of them being that Venus w was incandescent. It was recorded as incandescent by these ancient myth makers. And so he said, when they get to Venus, it will be you know, extremely hot. Mm. And uh, of course, at the time, it was thought that they would find uh, tropical forests and all sorts of things, you know, and creatures and living creatures on it. And uh, so the first spacecraft that uh, flew past Venus, its aim was to measure the temperature. But it went off the scale. They weren't actually able to tell <laughs> just how hot it was. And it wasn't until later they realized that it was about 800 degrees Fahrenheit or, you know, it was extremely hot. Um, so Velikovsky was vindicated. He also, before the Apollo mission, said they should check for the remnant magnetism of the rocks on the moon. And it was felt that the moon never had a magnetic field and therefore why should they look for magnetism? So when the rocks came back, they were magnetic. and But nobody bothered to actually take a photo of their location and how they were oriented before they picked them up and took their samples back. Anyway, <clears throat> as a result of following his work over the many years, ever since you know, I was a teenager, uh, I've been able to make what were seemingly outrageous predictions of my own uh, and I haven't been um, wrong in any of them, uh, which is an indication that following Velikovsky's lead, that is the way to do cosmology. In fact, cosmology should be the most general subject there is. Instead of that, we've got a whole lot of specialist theorists who are concentrating more on the mathematics than they are on actual observations. And one of the big results of that is that last year, 
in England, we announced that we had produced a, an electric star in the laboratory and it was doing everything that we that I'd predicted and that was that it would be transmuting elements in the photosphere and that the sun is does not have a thermonuclear center uh, it's, stars are not what we think they are they're electrically driven but they produce uh, nuclear energy at a benign level in their photospheres and we've approved that last year so um, it's been a hell of a journey. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And and just for those people out there who may not have uh, so much knowledge about just how in the big way does the electric universe differentiate from the mainstream theory of cosmology and, and physics? Uh, in almost every way. Uh, what I've been able to do is identify the scientists who actually were on the right path and uh, separate them out from those that have gone off into the thickets and have got lost. <laughs> and uh, th some of the figures that I've um, uh, identified uh, stretch back into the 1800s. Um, so we were actually closer to the electric universe in, um, towards the end of the 1800s than we are now. We've lost over a century. Uh, by go, you know, going off into new Pythagorean mysticism. You know, the mathematicians have taken over, and the yeah, mathematicians yeah. are not scientists. Mathematics is useful for scientists. It is not science. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what also I personally relate to a lot with the theory is that it makes us I mean, the electric universe is something that we all can understand and something that we mm. all can study. Whereas the way Cosmology is now, it's like for the rare genius, you know, that's at least the idea that's put in the media. And that's also why I'm happy that you're here and we can share this for everyone to know that we can all understand our origins and all yes. understand more of how the universe <coughs> works. Um, yes. And, and so, t while I'm not a physicist or cosmologist, the main mm -hmm. difference, if I understand correct, is that your theory is based around electricity whereas the mainstream theory is more based around gravity, is that correct, or how would you say it? Yes, um, the Big Bang theory is a gravitational theory, and it makes no sense at all. Um, I mean, the creation event is as miraculous as anything you read in the Bible. <laughs> uh, and uh, also, having a gravitational universe, <laughs> all that that can do is pull everything together. <laughs> and yet what we see in actual fact is, and the astronomer who I refer to uh, and has done the best work on cosmology is Halton Harp and many people who, particularly amongst amateurs, who know of him uh, call him the Galileo, the modern Galileo, because he was an observational astronomer who used to paper his walls with photographs of peculiar galaxies until he found that um, quasars, which is supposed to be sort of uh, a measuring stick they use, they measure their, their redshift to tell that they're at the ends of the universe, you know, as far away as we can see. And he pointed out, no, they're not. They're actually associated with active galaxy and are being the, the newborn baby galaxies, if you like. And when they're born, they are faint and they are highly redshifted. And I've done the physics, which shows how that works. Uh, so he was the man who showed that the universe is not expanding and because we don't know what stars really are and we don't know what quasars really are, this, the whole picture of the universe that's given by the conventional uh, theorists is completely distorted and wrong. Yeah. The electric, you know, the electric universe really, um, you know, nature is not trying to be difficult to understand. In fact, mm -hmm. Nature always does things the simplest way possible if we can just stop and look and <laughs> accept what's, what you see. Yeah. And uh, it's the, um, you know, the high priests, the mathematicians who uh, unfortunately like to invent new particles and new um, forces so that they get a Nobel Prize. So a lot of the Nobel Prizes that are handed out today are worthless, really. Mm. Yeah. So it's it's like the way that the system works as well, that 
we've just mm -hmm. created this kind of circle of rewarding maybe yes i mean uh, science today is done by a show of hands you know it's democratic it's the consensus that rules but uh, science is not a democratic um, endeavor mm. it never was in fact most of the uh, big breakthroughs in science have always come from individuals who are prepared to look at something from a fresh point of view Velikovsky showed me how to do that and that was a privilege that I it was absolutely priceless mm. uh, because all the way through university, I, the things I was being taught, I was looking at them from every angle to see whether it made sense or not. And um, quite a deal of it didn't. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, already a few of the predictions that you've made, which turned out to be correct. Do you have a few other examples that might be interesting for people to know about that the mainstream theories didn't predict yes. whatsoever? Yeah, there was one which was picked up by... Um, uh, Time, it wasn't Time magazine initially, but uh, it was picked up by one of the big web uh, news uh, people and uh, my website crashed under the load of people wanting to have a look. What I'd predicted was that the deep impact mission, which is where they put a copper projectile in front of a speeding comet so that when they hit at very high speed, it would create a crater. The expectation was that it would blast dust and rock and rubble and create a crater and the spacecraft that had released this copper projectile as it went past was to photograph the crater uh, as it went by. Well, when they announced the... Um, it was years before uh, the actual event, I predicted what would be found and practically everything I said uh, came was uh, verified. Mm -hmm. The first thing I said was that uh, as this copper projectile um, approaches the surface of the comet, the comet is highly electrically charged and there will be a flash, uh, an electrical flash or lightning discharge between the copper projectile and the comet. That was, that was found out, that was actually observed and uh, I was listening to the control room when they were getting the pictures back and uh, they remarked on it at the time but you won't hear anything about it now <laughs> mm. also i said the uh, cometary activity will uh, suddenly increase enormously because the uh, it won't just be a crater it'll be an electrical uh, readjustment of all of these plasma jets that are coming off the surface and suddenly you've got a cloud of copper you know highly conductive copper in the atmosphere of the comet it will shift the discharges to the point of impact. Well, the, the uh, dust and the, the uh, material that was shot off the surface, they couldn't actually photograph the uh, crater. Mm. And so they had to uh, re return to the uh, comet some years later and photograph that area. And they could hardly find a crater. I said the uh, comet is rocky and the, there will be very little crater. So all of these things were found to be true. Wow, interesting. Another one, interesting one, was um, the Saturn's moon Titan, which has this hazy atmosphere. And uh, there was a spacecraft sent out there, uh, the Cassini mission, uh, where they sent a Huygens probe into the atmosphere to photograph as it uh, descended on parachutes to the surface. Now, all of the theories up to that point said... Um, Titan is giving off methane all of the time and it can't have done, been doing that for four billion years therefore it must have oceans of ethane and methane and they expected that the um, this probe would plop into a, <laughs> an ocean of ethane and methane I wrote that um, what they will find beneath the clouds will look like uh, Mars or the Earth with a uh, scarred planetary surface and that's exactly what they found Mm. In fact, I said the scars on the surface will actually look like lightning scars. And uh, I actually, on my website, did a reverse image of the channels and their typical electric discharge patterns. Yeah, and I know as well that on your website and on the Fundables website and even on your YouTube, you have many more of these examples, right, for people who want oh, yes. to... Yes, yes. And it's been very easy. Mm. 
That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, once you have uh, a coherent, and this is the important thing about the electric universe, it's like a giant jigsaw puzzle. And I've spent my life trying to fit all the pieces, and it's only in the last year or two that I've managed to put some of the big pieces right where they should be. Oh. And uh, once you've done that, when new um, results come in from spacecraft, I just have a look at the puzzle and say, yep, that fits there, and that fits there. Uh, it's very easy. So um, we can do these space news uh, on the Thunderbolts website, thunderbolts.info, mm -hmm. and explain things as the results come in, <laughs> when the, the astronomers are continually puzzled by the results they get back. Yeah. Yeah, I remember uh, when I had science class in school, there was, I don't remember who created the theory, but there was, was this about the ad hoc assumptions, like, if you had a theory and you had to add too many extra assumptions, if things didn't work out, usually it was a sign that the theory had to be falsified. And it seems that science hasn't been going by that because they keep adding then this, no, this, that, and, and yeah. Yeah, it, my, my theory doesn't need extraordinary proof, just ordinary proof will do. Uh, it's, uh, the problem is that the standard um, consensus view takes extraordinary disproof. <laughs> mm. Yeah, if you don't mind, tell us a little bit about the kind of resistance you've met, because I, I think I heard that Velikovsky's books actually were put out of print, if I heard correctly, and they even yes. burned them, because it yes. was so much against this yeah, it, was a, it was a modern day book burning by the yeah. astronomer priests, you know, nothing's changed. <laughs> We don't learn from history. That That's one of the big uh, lessons I've learned, and that we must study the history and continue to ask answers and say, did we make the right decision back then when we followed Newton or, or any of the other major figures? But we don't do that. We, we put them on pedestals and say, right, that's sacrosanct. You may not say anything against this person. And so this is rubbish. That's not how science should be done. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I, I think also, like you mentioned a bit, that's one thing that I find very enjoyable about the theory is exactly that you use history and all of these mythological uh, mythological figures to mm -hmm. combine it with the science. Because like you say, history is super important. History is science as well, because it's yes. kind of like the experiment of life and seeing like what we learn throughout. Yes. Um, I'd, I'd love to ask you as well, well, for anyone watching this who really wants to understand the theory more, what, where will you suggest them to start? Um, <laughs> might I suggest the latest article I've written, which is about 6,000 words, appears on a website in Canada. Um, and it's the secular heretic. If you run all those words together, the secular heretic you'll find a major article by me on the Electric Universe. And that's a kind of a, a pricey of uh, a lot of the ideas. And it shows that all of the big uh, puzzles in science, including what is gravity, the force of gravity, uh, are explained briefly. But as I said um, to you earlier, um, when this book that uh, is being written right now comes out, it will have uh, the history of the ideas and all of the, all of them, all the ducks lined up, if you like. <laughs> yeah, that's the new book you're working on, right? Mm, mm. And if people, do you, do you have a newsletter on your site where people could subscribe to get notified of when the book is out, or how, how does it work? Um, yes, I think the best thing is to uh, subscribe to the Thunderbolts.info uh, Thunderbolts website. Mm -hmm. I'll put and them in. Get, yes, you'll get all of the latest news and things coming in off that website, and you can either choose to watch it or not. But many people uh, write and say, "I love to have this with my coffee in the morning," or you know, uh, and it does change people's lives because cosmology should give us a clear picture of our place in relation to everything else, the rest of the universe. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the electric universe does that. And people, uh, I've had some people, it's changed their lives from um, one of depression and not knowing, you know, having no aim in life to suddenly realizing that they, what, they're here to do something. Everyone's here to do something. 
and the thing is to find that and uh, the Electric Universe has inspired an amazing number of people. Uh, oh. In fact, I couldn't have succeeded if it hadn't been for the help of those people. Yeah, yeah, I want to mention to everyone that's watching out there too that Thunderbolts do have a Patreon as well where you can join and actually help uh, donate e every month to the work they're doing because it is a non-profit organization that runs mainly on donations and it can yes. be as little as five dollars a month so I put here the link so everyone can go check out their Patreon um, mm. and yes. yeah. yeah, do you have yeah. anything? Want to add well, it, it helps pay for our annual conferences, and our annual conferences are unlike any other uh, because no subject is taboo, really. Um, and uh, the Electric Universe does offer uh, helpful suggestions about ways of looking at things which you may not have considered in the past yeah. uh, in almost any field. It, you know, and, and it's this aspect of it, I think, which is missing in uh, the way people are taught these days. Instead of <clears throat> providing a student with a whole lot of um, facts to learn and, you know, the answers in the back of the book, uh, you need to challenge people with ideas. Uh, and looking at the history of science, what you should do is um, give our students two sides of the argument and ask them to make their own decision, you know, and give reasons why. That way you, you inspire people because they have to think about it and not just memorise it. And yeah. you don't forget those sorts of lessons. Mm -hmm. I understand, yeah. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to do, we're going to do like a bonus question, which is going to be also because I have a patron, it's going to be for my patrons so they get something extra. Um, yes. So, for you guys out there now, um, again, if you want to learn more about the Electric Universe and Wall, I'll put every link in the description and I highly encourage you to check it out. Um, because mm -hmm. I just want to say that even me as a person with no background in cosmology or physicist, I agree 100% what you said, this kind of theory has given me the feeling of we're all connected. It's a theory based on connection instead of disconnection. And yes. I think, I mean, I'm convinced that there's so much truth to it. But again, go check out everything, guys, so you can educate yourself. Like Wall says, don't just accept something blindly, but actually look at the proof we have. Mm -hmm. And as a final say, Wall, do you have anything you want to add to people, anything important they should know? Yes, I think that that is a very uh, crucial aspect of the Electric Universe you just mentioned. Basically, uh, the electric universe is, simplifies ideas so that it's easy to grasp, but yeah. simply because nature also is simple once you get the right answers. Mm -hmm. And uh, the electric force, there's only a single force in the electric universe, and that's the electric force. That's all you need. You can explain magnetism and gravity and the nuclear force simply in terms of just that one force. That means, and also this electric force is instantaneous. So the universe is a connected whole, it is conscious, mm. and we are a representation of the consciousness of the universe. We are here to learn, and what we learn is fed back into the universe. Uh, we are not here uh, just on a whim. We actually choose to manifest, which is an interesting idea. And uh, if you can find why you... <laughs> while you are here, uh, a lot of it's knocked out of us when we're very young, but as a child, I think a lot of children know what it is <clears throat> they want to do. <clears throat> Pardon me. And it can be quite simple, you know. Yeah. It doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be world changing, just helping others, uh, being, realizing you are connected. Uh, and even in this present situation, if you understand the meaning of life, not the one we're taught in either religiously or by science, uh, you realize that this is an episode in a an infinite journey and therefore you live in the moment, you uh, feel the connectedness and don't allow the fear mongers to have any influence on you because it's they who are the people who don't know anything about life. Yeah, 
That's wonderful. So we're just going to do a little question, which is going to be for the Patreon. You almost already covered it, but it's um, kind of my intention for the interview is to also bring a bigger picture to everything and also why I to contact you and I'd love to hear your point of view on how do you think this electric universe theory could alter I, our idea of the world as a human consciousness and species, if it was right. widely accepted. <clears throat> yes. Uh, <clears throat> one of the books that Velikovsky wrote, it's the last one he wrote, was called Mankind in Amnesia. Mm. Now, it, from the historical re reconstruction, we know that the uh, Earth has suffered catastrophes, global catastrophes, in, uh, and mankind was decimated. And we have plenty of evidence for people living in caves. They weren't cave men, they were modern humans trying desperately to save themselves from uh, rocks and, uh, uh, you know, planet altering lightning from space. Yeah. And uh, there are plenty of uh, arcane um, uh, beliefs. For instance, you know, the Druids, the Druids that knew that the uh, those rock um, shelters that you see in uh, in Europe and across uh, the northern uh, parts of the UK uh, were built as shelters. They they actually had a fairly clear record of what happened. Even the Australian Aborigines in their dream time, their stories are some of the most accurate in the world because they identified objects in the sky uh, quite accurately. Uh, but of course we don't pay any attention because it has no meaning for us. Once we have this uh, sense of a shared destiny on this planet and uh, we sort of recover from the um, irrational behavior. Velikovsky, who was a trained psychoanalyst as well as a genius in other aspects, said that uh, the greatest danger facing mankind is mankind himself because we do not recall our past. In fact, we actively deny it. And the problem with that is in an amnesiac, somebody who has suppressed the memory of some event they just can't deal with, is that they have the subconscious urge, because the subconscious knows about it, mm. subconscious mm -hmm. urge to repeat it, sometimes on other people. In other words, this is the warlike behavior and uh, them and us, the separation, when there shouldn't be any separation. Um, I think this is one of the most important lessons for our own survival on this planet, is to come to terms with our history and understand ourselves for the first time. It is very, it's an exhilarating feeling, understanding this. It really is. Mm. It's, you know, so um, that's important. From the technological point of view, uh, we understand electric biology far more uh, than anyone does at present. Um, and that means that we can identify technologies which have gone ahead without any underpinning science and it's causing a lot of trouble. You know, people are worried about um, uh, electromagnetic radiation and so on. Well, the biologists have no idea of the effect of electromagnetic radiation on a coherent living system. Uh, they just go ahead anyway because somebody's going to make some money out of it. In terms of uh, energy sources, our electric star has shown that we can produce power like the sun at low cost and without all of the drama and radioactive material. In mm. fact, we think it can actually remediate radioactive material and use it, burn it up, get rid of it. Wow. So it both offers solution like spiritually and also technologically and yes. energy yes. Do you, why do you think we had that amnesia? I think this is a response of the mind to something which is too overwhelming uh, to uh, respond to. Also, uh, we misinterpreted what the ancients felt was the most important messages they could send us because there's n absolutely nothing in our experience that allows us to interpret and to uh, translate their words for what they really were. Okay. Even the sun, the sun, the original sun, uh, the words were transferred from the planet Saturn. Mm. 
Mm. Saturn was originally Sol and Helios, uh, and then they transferred it to our present sun. And the Australian Aborigines have legends of when there were two suns in the sky. Can you imagine that? Mm -hmm. The stories we've been told about the clockwork solar system are pure fiction. Yeah, that is so interesting. And mm. it's very interesting what you talk about because um, it actually sounds a lot like what many like metaphysical teachers are teaching at this point as well. I don't know if you're familiar yes. with Raiden, for instance. He talks yes. about the prime matrix and I'm always, I always love when you can combine the two things. Like to me, there always has to be science. Otherwise, it's easy to believe anything and everything in a way. You know, mm -hmm. when you actually mm -hmm. combine the two things, suddenly it's like you have the connection again. Yes, mm -hmm. there have always been uh, great people on Earth who have somehow connected with the subconscious and uh, and who know what the real story is in a in a kind of a way you know but it's never been scientifically done we've done it scientifically and so we can understand these uh, people uh, artists and this is one of the things we bring the arts back into science you cannot separate cosmology from anything it's got to be a total umbrella and answer questions in any subject you like to ask yeah um, and now I'm curious about one thing as well. Does the electric universe predict any possible, um, well, without making it sound catastrophic, but any possible like catastrophes like we already experienced at this point? Is there any predictions of something like that? No. no. <laughs> one, one of the nice things about the uh, electric universe is that it, generally it's in balance. It's a balanced universe. There is no expansion. Everything is going about its business in a very orderly way. Okay. Uh, it's only occasionally when uh, one star encounters another on its journey, and uh, they they have a little dance, and uh, yeah. they sh they shed planets, and <laughs> all sorts of interesting things happen. And it was just that mankind, early mankind, uh, witnessed the dismemberment of a former star system when it encountered the present sun and we were part of that other star system so we are actually the aliens in this solar system yeah. which is a rather mind-bending idea but um, when you realize that uh, we are citizens of the universe uh, none of this matters yeah and for everyone wanting to know more in the Gaia show it's explained very well exactly what happened and what caused this um, early catastrophe and everything. So guys, go check that out as well. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think that, I mean, there's we could keep talking all day, obviously, because Wall has <laughs> dedicated almost his entire life to, to researching this and to bringing us knowledge, which is so important at this day and age that we are right mm -hmm. now. And I'm sure that it's, all been very well planned in a more divine way you know that human reached this point where we have to change and where we have to learn our origins and so i can only say thank you so much well for everything that you've done for humans and everything that you're still doing um, we <laughs> and book um that will come out and um, yeah i can only say thank you i don't know if you have anything final words you want to say to people or what you say is correct. Uh, I've always followed my intuition, which is, I think, the closest you can come to talking to your higher self. And uh, I've had this um, feeling for many, many years, maybe decades, that the enormity of this change is such that it will require some kind of disaster on Earth, which uh, is concentrating people's minds on the future. You know, we, we don't like what we see. We need something better. This is the something better. For sure, yeah. All right, well, thank you so much. Again, everyone, if you are new to these theories, please go check it out. Even if you feel like you don't understand it or if you're not sure if it sounds correct, just go give it a read because that's how you learn if, if you find something in there that resonates with you. And um, if you already know the theories, well, 
go learn some more. <laughs> and yeah. um, go join yeah. the Fundables at the Patreon. Go to the website fundables.info and uh, the whole signs. And um, yeah, thank you all. It's all I can say. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. And um, I hope that one day I can get to meet you in person and, and thank you in person. Mm -hmm. For now, Thanks. it's been more than I expected. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Cecily. It's been a pleasure to talk to somebody in Scandinavia. Um, I do have some uh, heritage from uh, Sweden. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Yeah, I'm actually in Spain right now. The weather is better, but yeah, Scandinavia is good. <laughs> <laughs>